1. Good afternoon and welcome to the Mid-Atlantic Capital Sources Virtual Forum hosted by the law firm of Van Deventer Black. My name is Chris Ambrosio and I'm the chair of Van Deventer Black's Business Law Group. On behalf of myself and my partner, Richard Crouch, and the rest of the team at Van Deventer Black, I would like to welcome each of you to this year's forum. This is our fourth year hosting the Mid-Atlantic Capital Sources Forum. We created this event as a way to bring together industry experts in the sources and uses of capital with business owners and managers looking to expand, transition, or exit their businesses. And as a side note, I should mention that we typically advise our clients that the best time to think about these types of events is upon formation of the business. The second best time is right now. So thank you again for joining us. While there appears to be light at the end of the pandemic tunnel, out of an abundance of caution, we have elected to hold this spring's forum virtually. We are hoping and trying to plan for another in-person forum this coming fall. So if conditions permit, uh, we will do that. Stay tuned for more information. Meanwhile, today's virtual forum is a way for our experts on the panel to share their insight into current market conditions, including the lingering effect of the coronavirus, as well as the outlook for the near future. Uh, let me mention a couple of procedural notes before we get started. Uh, first of all, if you have questions, uh, please use the chat feature on your screen. Uh, that can be found in the row of boxes near the bottom of your screen, uh, or sometimes maybe it's at the top, it's the Q&A uh, button. And if you have questions, uh, please post them there. And uh, my partner, Richard Crouch will collect and organize them and we will uh, have those questions addressed at the end of the program. We may not get to all the questions, but we will try. Uh, secondly, the speaker's presentation that you'll see uh, will be available after the program. It is also available in that same Q&A chat box as a link. Uh, if you see the link there, uh, click on it and you will download the, uh, the slide deck and you can follow along. Uh, we are happy to have a distinguished panel for you today. We have Dr. Vinod Agarwal from Old Dominion University, Laura Markley, Managing Director of NRV, which is a venture capital firm based in Richmond, and Jay Offerdahl, who is President of Viking Mergers and Acquisitions based in Charlotte. I will int introduce the speakers in more detail at the start of their respective presentations. Our first panelist is Dr. Vinod, Vinod Agarwal, who is the Deputy Director of the Dragas Center for Economic Analysis and Policy at Old Dominion University, where he is also a professor of economics in the Strom College of Business. To the Hampton Roads business community, Dr. Agarwal does not really need an introduction. Uh, he is a frequent speaker at high profile events where he provides keen insight into local, regional, and national economic trends and phenomena. By way of background, Dr. Agarwal earned his doctoral degree from the University of California at Santa Barbara beautiful place, uh, I'm sure. Uh, he served as a member of the Virginia College Building Authority for the Commonwealth of Virginia from July of 2004 through June of 2012. He was a member of the Governor's Advisory Board of Economists from 2006 to 2010. Professor Agarwal also served as the chairman of the Old Dominion University Economics Department from 2001 to 2006. Today, he will tell us about COVID-19 and its continuing impact on the economy and the trends and outlook related uh, there too. Dr. Agarwal, the floor is yours. Chris, thank you very much for a very nice introduction. And I'm glad to join you in this new environment. Next slide, please. <clears throat> COVID-19 pandemic has certainly changed our personal lives and it continues to append the global and national economies. Adverse impacts of COVID-19 started to affect the economic performance in the nation, beginning sometime in the first week in March 2020. And it continues to do so as we speak today. We came to know new terms stay at home orders, wear a mask, attend Zoom meetings, and the like, and of course, shutdowns. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Next. 
Briefly, COVID-19 infections peaked early in April. Then they peaked again in July. And then again in mid-January. And each time we seem to have recovered. Question is, are we going to yet see another peak due to the spread of variants of COVID-19? Or are we going to see a continued decline due to increased vaccinations? I'm hoping it is the latter. Next, please. Infections lead to some hospitalizations and then subsequently to deaths. We should continue to see a downward trend in the number of deaths due to the current decline in infections. Next, please. If you look at infections in the Commonwealth of Virginia or Hampton Roads, we seem to be following the same trend as for the nation. This has, however, the declining trend in the recent past has led to easing restrictions, initially effective April 1st, and now a further easing effective May 15th. Hopefully, we're going to start seeing a new normal pretty soon. Let us now examine the effect of COVID-19 on the national economy. Jobs first, and then the real GDP. Next, please. Peak employment throughout the nation and in various sub-markets was observed generally in February 2010. Sorry, February 2020. However, we saw the economy lose over 22 million jobs from February to April within two months. We have recovered approximately 14 million of those jobs. However, nationally, we still have about 8.5 million fewer jobs than what we had in February 2020. We have a long way to go. By the way, we observe a similar pattern when we examine employment of individuals. Compared to employment in February 2020, we find that in March 2021, there were still about 8 million fewer individuals employed in the nation. So who was affected by COVID-19? Next slide, please. Okay, we are missing a slide, so don't worry about it. No, this is older version. Go ahead. Go ahead. Don't worry about it. We saw a consistent growth in national GDP in terms of overall economic activity as measured by GDP since the second quarter of 2014 and all the way through quarter four of 2019. So what happens in 2020? Well, COVID-19, GDP declined on an annual basis, as you can see, by about 5% in the first quarter, followed by a whopping 31.4% decline in the second quarter on an annualized basis. This was the largest drop in GDP since we have been keeping records. For comparison, during the height of the Great Recession, GDP had declined by only 8.4%. Yes, in the third quarter of 2020, GDP actually increased by 33.4% due to primarily CARES Act and the stimulus provided therein. But remember, this was for a much lower base. GDP had declined by 31.4% in the second quarter. GDP also increased by about 4.3% in the fourth in the fourth quarter. However, on an annual basis, GDP declined, real GDP declined by about 3.5% in 2020 relative to 2019. Next slide, please. 
this should come as a surprise to you. For 2020, despite, uh, despite the decline in jobs and number of individuals employed and the decline in GDP, real disposable income which individuals had in this country actually increased by nearly 6% in 2020. Further, real disposable personal income increased by nearly 11% in January 2021, after increasing by 15% in April 2020. So why these substantial increases in these two months, January and April? These increases were the direct result of expansionary fiscal policy, direct stimulus checks, paycheck protection program, enhanced unemployment benefits under the CARES Act passed in March 2020. Likewise, the upward shift in January is a direct result of the stimulus package of $900 billion passed in December 2020. Congress has yet passed yet another package worth $1.9 trillion in March 2021, and we expect to see a significant increase in real disposable income coming in for March 2021. The data should be released in two days. Next slide, please. While the Trump administration had adopted an expansionary fiscal policy, and the Biden administration has continued to do so to combat the adverse economic impacts of COVID-19. The Federal Reserve also took on a very accommodative monetary policy. It brought short-term interest rates to near zero, changed policy on inflation, more on this in a second, began to purchase $80 billion a month in government securities, and the $40 billion a month in mortgage bonds to keep long-term interest low. The Federal Reserve now seeks to achieve maximum employment and targets inflation at a rate of 2% over the longer run. With inflation running persistently below its long-run goal in the last few years, the Fed will aim to achieve inflation moderately above 2% for some time so that inflation averages 2% over time. By the way, not shown in this graph, year over year substan substantial increase in CPI was observed in March 2021. Not so much so for the core CPI. However, the increase in CPI in March 2021 can be attributed primarily to a rise in gasoline prices plus a rise in food prices. Next slide, please. With expansionary monetary policy in place, the average mortgage rate on 30-year fixed mortgage dropped to 3.11% in 2020, the lowest level in the nearly 50-year history of the Freddie Mac survey. We expect the mortgage rates to continue to average near 3% in 2021. Incidentally, when I was uh, developing this uh, presentation, I debated if I should have a 30-year fixed mortgage rate or a 10-year Treasury bond yield. I chose the 30 year fixed mortgage rate for one simple reason. If there was a sector which was largely unaffected by COVID 19, it was the residential housing market. The median prices in Hampton Roads, for example, increased by over 9% in 2020 compared to 2019. Those of you who don't follow, the 10 year bond rate. I'm sure most of you do, but those of you do not. 10 year bond yield, the difference between 10 year bond, bond yield and the 30 year fixed mortgage, 
runs roughly in the range of 150 to 180 basis points. This range for this year, January 1st, 21 to present, has been about 150 basis points. In other words, the yield has been about 150 basis points lower than the mortgage rate. Let us now examine the impact of COVID-19 on Hampton Roads labor market. Next slide, please. Since the trough of jobs observed in February 2010 through February 2020, Hampton Roads has slowly gained nearly 70,000 jobs <coughs> over 10 years. However, in the span of two months, next please, not only we lost all those gains, we lost another 34,000 jobs. Next please. As the economy began to open, we did gain substantial amount of those lost jobs. However, we are still about 40,000 jobs below where we were back in February 2010. Actually, according to this chart, since it only goes to February, it's about 35,000. But if you were to look at the numbers from March 2021, they'll actually show a loss of about 40,000 jobs. These gains in jobs, again, could be attributed to expansionary fiscal policy due to CARES Act, the $900 billion stimulus checks, which and you, you would should, we should start seeing a recovery again in April and May due to the latest American Rescue Plan. Next slide, please. Another way of looking at the labor market is to look at employment of individuals. Both the labor force as well as employment of individuals was growing quite nicely through February 2010. However, since that time, labor force has decreased by roughly 32,000. In other words, 32,000 individuals have simply left the labor force. In addition, the number of individuals employed has declined by roughly 57,000. So the gap between these two, what you see the labor force and number of people employed, gives you the size of the unemployment, um, unemployed pool. However, if the labor force has remained the same, next please, as, as we had in February 2010, the pool of unemployed workers would be even larger and unemployment rate should be higher than what is observed in the official statistics because official statistics only compares unemployment relative to the size of the labor force. So when you look at unemployment rates today for Hampton Roads or for the nation for that matter, if the whole labor force the same as it was in February 2010, 2020, unemployment rate would be even higher. Now let us examine the performance of the hotel industry in Hampton Roads. Next slide, please. It should not surprise anyone that hospitality industry was severely impacted by COVID-19, as were the brick and mortar retail stores. It took the industry almost seven years to recover initially from the Great Recession and subsequent sequestration. However, since 2013, the industry was improving significantly, and we expected this growth to continue even in 2020. Obviously, that did not happen. Here comes COVID-19. Hotel revenues in Hampton Roads declined by over $300 million, or in other words, these revenues were about 35.5% lower in 2020 than they were in 2019. Let's take a slightly deeper drive into this. Next, please. 
COVID-19 started to adversely affect the performance of hotel industry soon after the first week in March. If you look at the blue line here, hotel revenues dropped by 44% in March relative to March 2019, and a whopping 76% decline in April. As the economy began to recover, open up, national economy opened up, Virginia economy opened up, you can see this decline to get smaller and smaller. But end of February 21, the decline was only 17% lower than what it was in February 20. You also see a decline in number of rooms sold showed by that line. You notice the decline in number of rooms sold were smaller than decline in revenue. And it is, could be attributed to the change in the mixture of travelers. Next slide, please. Nationally, if you look at the blue line, which represents revenue per available room, a measure of performance, key performance indicator for the hotel industry, upper upscale hotels used to have a rep part of $137 in February 2020. By April 20, it had gone to $10 per room. I have no idea how this hotel survived. So why such a steep decline? But these are the hotels who in general depend upon corporate travelers, government travelers, conventions, large conferences, group meetings, including weddings, sporting and other cultural events. Well, all those things have essentially come to a halt in 2020. Again, as the economy opened up slightly, the revenue start, rep part started to increase, but at the end of February 21, as you can see, it was a third of what it was in February 2020 for these upper upscale hotels. The economy in mid-scale hotels also were affected, but not by as much as you can see in this slide, because these are the type of hotels who depend primarily on leisure travelers who are quite price sensitive. And also, these are the individuals who often travel by automobiles. Next slide, please. I will conclude my presentation with slightly better news for you. Defense spending plays a very key role in the growth or stagnation of our economy. As we have pointed out in the previous years, about 40% of our economic activity can be directly or indirectly traced to what happens to Department of Defense spending. Direct nominal spending from 2012 to 2017 in Hampton Roads was flat. Our economic growth was also flat during these times. We, uh, since 2017, we see a steady growth in Department of Defense spending. We estimate the DOD spending increased by 6% in 2020, and we expect it to increase by another 5% in 2021. Thanks to the sustained defense DOD spending in Hampton Roads, we expect the regional GDP in Hampton Roads will decline by only 2.5% in 2020 compared to a 3.5% decline in national GDP. Also, due to this increase in defense spending, we expect our economy to have a slightly higher GDP growth for Hampton Roads than for the nation. If Vaccinations hold up. If COVID-19 does not get worse, we expect a much better performance of the economy during the second half of this year. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Agarwal.
um, very informative as always, and those numbers and particularly that volatility is, is extraordinary. Um, and hopefully we <laughs> don't have to go through anything like that uh, again uh, uh, in our lifetimes or our children's lifetimes. Um, as a reminder, if you have questions for Dr. Agarwal or for any of the speakers, you can type them into the live event Q&A chat box. Um, uh, my partner Richard Crouch will collect and collate them and uh, we will address them uh, at the end of all of the uh, presentations. So uh, thank you again, Dr. Agarwal. Our next speaker is Jay Offerdahl, who's the president of Viking Mergers and Acquisitions. Jay's father, Brad, was a serial entrepreneur growing and selling three of his own businesses. Brad saw an opportunity to take his real world knowledge to assist other closely held business owners with their exit strategy. After Jay graduated from Appalachian State with a finance degree, he and his father founded Viking Mergers and Acquisitions in June of 1996. In 2015, Jay bought out his father and continued to grow the business, opening up additional offices. Today, Viking has seven offices and is the largest of its kind in the Southeast. Jay continues to be recognized as a trusted top producing business intermediary while, while helping lead and guide the Viking team with record growth. Jay's dedication and experience, combined with his passion for serving business owners, are found in hundreds of successfully closed transactions and satisfied client testimonials. Jay, go ahead. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Dr. Agarwal, for that information. I always learn something new that I probably should have. Uh, I don't have all the beautiful charts and graphs. I'm, I'm just a, I'm a talker, and I'm going to share my thoughts and opinions on what I've seen and experience, especially in the, in the last 15 months. Uh, so next slide. So as everyone knows, it was horrific in the second quarter of, of 2020 when there was this, this giant pause of when COVID hit, you know, everything just came to a screeching halt. And during that time period and since then, we've lost a tremendous amount of uh, retail, restaurant, hotel businesses that just couldn't sustain. Even with some of the stimulus money, a lot of people were packing up the Southeast actually benefited a little bit uh, uh, because a lot of people were moving out of the bigger cities. Even Charlotte today has 100 new people a day moving here, uh, many of which just left their businesses and shut down and, and, and wanted to come to a, a different area to, to start over. The, the positive of what happened in the second quarter from the buyer's perspective is they had an opportunity to assess what kind of the the worst case scenario is and if you think about if you're a business owner or and you are looking to expand i really think the next three years is a critical time to consider to either be acquired or to acquire other other businesses but whenever you're doing your charts and graphs and budgets it's often difficult to assess what you could feel as okay what if things really went bad what would happen so we had a, a taste of that. And if you think about due diligence being the opportunity to assess risk, but what better way after coming out of the second quarter as things you know started to get back on track in certain industries um, to know what your, your risk was, what you're signing up for. So what happened after that giant pause? And at that time, we peaked out at around 48 or 50 active engagements, which is it's a good number, uh, but we did not sell a single business in the second quarter of 2020. But with the help of that, the help of some of the stimulus money that came through the CARES Act, especially for businesses priced below 10 million, there was a tremendous opportunity for individual buyers, strategic buyers and private equity groups to borrow money at a very low interest rate to buy some businesses that may have been suppressed a little bit. We also saw businesses that weren't as sexy all of a sudden, sudden become very desirable because some of these businesses, think of like all the home projects, landscaping, room additions, remodeling that happened when everyone was stuck at home, uh, boat sales, bike sales, workout equipment. So there's a ton of businesses that really prospered that time period. And there's some businesses that historically didn't have that curb appeal that all of a sudden looked really desirable because they didn't have the impact. So as we see, you know, the end of 2020 and, and now through 2021, we're seeing tremendous activity. Our listing base has shrunk because we sold so many businesses from 48 down to about 28. 
and 15 of those deals are under contract. So we really don't have a lot of inventory similar to the housing market where homes are on the market at least in the Charlotte area. We only have 16 days of inventory. I think a balanced market is around 100 days, maybe even 120. So what you're seeing is a lot of pent up interest. You're seeing low interest rates. You're seeing opportunity, buy opportunities. And you're also seeing some of the private equity groups come a little bit downstream or, or I should use a straight terminology, lo look at lower price points because the multiples are a little bit smaller. So if you look at all the businesses from, you know, 1 million to let's say 100 million, if you're over 100 million, then, then uh, you need to talk to somebody else and I can point you the right direction. But on average, those are six to eight times EBITDA. And we'll talk a little bit more about EBITDA and cash flow and multiples in a minute. So next slide, please. So the concerns going forward right now are the current um, potential tax increases, both on corporate and long term capital gains. And, and, and I like to talk as if um, people don't already, already know this, but if you're a business owner and you have a pass through entity, then your, your profits of your company flow to your 1040 and you pay ordinary income tax. Uh, those rates that cap out currently federal wise at 37 percent. Those are supposed to go up to 39.6 percent. I have no problem with that. That's for everything over 420 some thousand dollars. I feel like that's perfectly, um, you know, palatable and, and, and those the, the people making that money can absorb that. Where I get concerned is at the corporate level. If you go from 21 back to 35 or even back up to 28, you really don't encourage growth from an employment perspective or capital expense as far as buying equipment and spending money in open locations uh, and, and then also for the, the smaller business owner the last thing they want to do is think about having to, to pay additional taxes that don't really benefit their business so it's a it's a it's an opposite effect for the business community when the government really increases tax and the big one is currently they want to increase long-term capital gains tax so think about the sale of uh, commercial real estate, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, uh, the sale of a, of a closely held business that you've had over two years from current to high rate of 20 percent all the way up to 39.6. So if you're a 60 year old business owner and you're in North Carolina and you sold right now in 2021, you're all in tax on, on the goodwill portion, not on the recapture of, of equipment, but, but just figure, figure the goodwill allocation is about 27 and a half percent. So if you sold a, a five million dollar business, let's round that up to 30 percent all in that state that's federal. That's that's Obamacare 3.8 percent. You're going to pay a, about 1.5 million. Which is a lot, but if you're looking to retire, um, you know, and you've got a little bit else saved saved up, you could look at that and say, you know, I'm, I may be OK with that. If if this tax law goes forward as proposed, that same business owner this time next year would pay an, an additional million dollars just in federal taxes. And Lord help you if you're in California and you've got 12 or 14 percent state, you know, and all that stuff. It just doesn't make sense. So that that's my big fear. Some of that is, is selfish because I know that that would impact people looking to uh, flip businesses, but I'm a I'm a big fan of free enterprise and, and, and flipping of real estate and people do 1031 exchanges to defer their taxes. Um, and if taxes go up, they'll find other ways to find ways of not paying. When the taxes are lower, there's more commerce, there's more turns on that money and there's actually more taxable that goes to it. And it's shown this would cost at least a million and a half jobs in the United States. Next slide. So in a nutshell, there's about 29 to 30 small businesses in the United States. Most of those are single shingles or one person operators. There's nothing wrong with that, but there's not a lot of value um, in, you know, if, if you're the only person and, and you're trying to sell that. But about six million of those are what I would call businesses that have equity in it, that are, that are available and, and should sell. The amazing thing is four million of those are owned by what we define as the baby boomers. And there's 10,000 boomers a day turning 70 through 2034. 
And those 4 million businesses represent roughly in the neighborhood between eight, I've heard as high as $12 trillion uh, of enterprise value. And those businesses need to go somewhere. My biggest fear of that generation, and my dad is one of those, and he, he was okay. He, my, his exit strategy was me, so it worked out just fine for him. But a lot of those uh, individuals, uh, their business defines them. And my biggest fear is, is people that hold on to those reins a little bit too long. And in the buying community, and we'll talk about the, the different buyer types, but whenever a business kind of hits a peak and starts going down, the buyer and the lender's first question is, where's the bottom? And it's impossible to time the market when you're investing in stocks, bonds, mutual fund, and it's almost impossible to time when to sell a business. But people always say, why would I sell? I'm doing great. And it's like, you just answered your own question. The time to lock in your gain is when there's a buyer pool that can see some runway for them to continue that growth and not when you peak out and start deteriorating. So if we take this eight to $12 trillion, and you're and, and there's a business owner that's you know turning 70 and they're thinking about retiring all of a sudden they're faced with a an increase of almost 20 percent in taxes so that three and a half million dollars example now is two and a half million dollars after tax and we know that 75 percent of their net worth is tied up in the equity of that business they may hold on to that business longer than they should and even at, at that two and a half million if they did sell if they don't just they get scared of the taxes if they hold it a couple more years and things deteriorate, they may lose even more. And the key is when you're talking about that equity is making sure that they can sell that, even if it's an internal sale to management or family members, they still need to get the value in cash to help solidify their own retirement, which then creates a generational possibility for that money to grow, at least the principal be passed on to the next generation. And that continues to increase the tax base. So, the, the, the big idea is when you think about 75%, and, it's, and these are rough numbers, but think about 75% of the small businesses are owned by the baby boomers. 75% of their net worth is tied up in the, in the value of their business. 75% of those people don't have an exit strategy. And even a scarier statistic is 75% of the businesses brought to market. And these are just the smaller businesses. These aren't the uh, eight-figure deals. These are the single Figure you seventy five percent of business brought to market never sell. Now I'm proud to say at Viking our our stats are the reverse of that. We sell about eighty percent of the business that we engage, but we're not successful about one out of, of five times. And there's things outside of our control. You know, life changes to the to the seller. Um, business has a has a hiccup and has an off quarter. They lose a key account or or, or, or customer or vendor or employee. Those are all things that, that could deter that, but so many business owners don't take the time to really think about how they're going to exit on their terms so that the terms aren't dictated to them, but they get to exit on their terms. Next slide, please. Hey, Jay, this is Chris. If I could interrupt just for one second on yes, the sir. point of, of older business owners, <laughs> not to bring more doom and gloom, but Congress and the president are also looking at ways to reduce the um, lifetime credit from a state tax, uh, reduce that ceiling. You know, currently it's uh, uh, 11 million, I think, uh, per person. That it, they're thinking about bringing that down to maybe three and a half or even lower. So, if That's a, a scary if a person, you know, old, older seller has a very successful business and they don't unload it in a arm's length transaction. And they pass it through their estate. The government could take forty-five percent of whatever's above that. That, that yeah, threshold. Chris, thank you for adding that, and, and that, that adds to it. You start thinking about people are starting businesses with after-tax dollars. They sell and they get taxed, and then then when they pass that money around, it's taxed again. And I know a lot of people say, "Well, eleven million dollars—that's a lot of money. They can afford to pay tax." I don't. I don't disagree with that. People can't afford to pay tax of, above that. But what, what people don't understand is when they say, well, the you know, all these business owners are, are getting rich. Like, no, these business owners took huge risks and, and, and it looks glamorous from the outside, but they're putting everything online. If they don't make it, there's a huge percentage of businesses that don't make it. A lot of them lose everything. So if you're willing to take the risk, you should be able to, to gain the, the, the rewards of, of taking that risk. And at the, at the end of the day, uh, if we're going to kind of really put our, our, our foots down on, on business owners that are pr providing tremendous amount of, of employment opportunities for the, the, you know, the citizens of the United States, 
they're, they're just not looking at it the, the correct way. We should continue to reward small business owners because I've never worked for a poor person. So you need to let some people make money and, and so they can hire. And they buy boats and cars and houses and, and that all creates jobs to, for someone to build that boat and build that house and build that car. So this, this next slide, it's it's interesting, you know, the average business and of course this take, we don't sell a lot of restaurants and retail businesses, but if you take in all businesses, the average business change hands every 10 years because people get burned out. They hit an invisible ceiling about year seven about their, about their capability. So if they're smart, they'll go ahead and, and, and exit, they'll lock in their gain, they'll stay for the transition, they'll recharge their battery. And that's what I saw my dad do successfully, you know, four times, counting with me. The thing about businesses, and I get a lot of phone calls and people say, well, I've got this great, you know, IP intellectual property, I've got this great patent, I've got this great website, I've got, you know, this wonderful thing. Every once in a while, you'll read about someone selling, you know, an idea uh, for, you know, tens and hundreds of millions of dollars. The reality is 99.999% of the time, businesses are selling for a multiple of the cash flow. And cash flow is the EBITDA, the earnings before, interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, plus if it's below a million dollars, plus you're adding the owner's W2 salary in there because most of the time, the owner is being replaced in three to 12 months by the individual buyer. When you start getting above a million dollars in cash flow, you do start flipping over to a multiple of just EBITDA where the buying group, maybe strategic or a private equity group or a family fund is looking to re retain the management team and they're just using a multiple of, of EBITDA. So most of those multiples of cash flow are two and a half to five. So think about businesses that have less than a million dollars of overall cash flow. And then when you get above the million, again, this is just my opinion. Once you get above a million dollars, you talk about ranging from four to 12. Uh, right now, hot businesses, you know, the, 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 the veterinarian hospitals, for whatever reason, are just sought after. And there's a lot of roll ups in, in that space. Insurance and anything that's got reoccurring revenue is, is always uh, attractive. Um, the SaaS, S-A-A-S, software as a service, um, three to seven is kind of the, the average. But I've, I've seen a couple of trading it and also 12 times revenue. That's top line revenue, not <laughs> bottom line net income. Now, to attain that, you've got to be growing at 30% a year. It's got to be truly a subscription-based uh, offering, and you've got to have multi-million dollars in, in sales. You don't have to be profitable yet. <laughs> you just have to have high growth and, and, and high top, growing high top-line sales. Uh, next slide, please. So preparation, if you're a business owner or you, you know a business owner or you work with business owners, so your accountant, attorney, financial advisor, banker um we, we can't stress enough that that it's time to to figure out what you've accomplished and the only way to do that is get evaluation and i always call it put a stake in the ground let's look at your business show you what your business is worth based on how you've been running it most business owners aren't trying to maximize shareholders wealth like a public company they're trying to minimize their taxes so december 1st they're calling their cpa and saying i'm showing two and a half million dollars of profit how do we cut it in half and that's that's one way to, you know, that they approach it. So what we like to do is we'll like say, okay, this is how your business is looked at from a buyer and a lender's perspective. Let's work over the next 12, 18, 24 months to change your mentality and look at for every $100,000 that you run through your business, you may be saving yourself a $33,000 tax, effective tax rate, maybe even 35,000. But for every $100,000 you show in profit from the previous slide, we know you're worth about 400 to potentially over a million dollars per 100,000. So do you wanna save $35,000 in taxes or do you wanna add a 10X, a 20X on that tax savings in enterprise value? And so we start with that, that valuation. We try to get them to do consistent accounting, reconcile your bank statements. You know, accrual accounting matches revenue with expenses. That is according to CPAs, the, the right way to do most accounting because uh, you know, you, you, you're matching revenue with expenses. It shows the true profitability of the company. You want to make sure you're duly organized. You've got your organizational chart. You have job descriptions. You have handbooks, mission, vision, and core values. These are things that you can have outside people help you do. You make sure your contracts are assignable. So you have a lease. You want to make sure you have a long-term lease in place that can be assignable. You don't want to tie yourself up too long, but if you can get, you know, three to five-year 
leases or options on top of your current lease and have three, four, five of those so they can extend out 10, 12, 14, 16 years, that helps someone know that they've got the ability to stay in that location if they choose to. Look at your vendor contracts and then know, know your reason for selling. One of the things that I found ourse ourselves doing a lot is we're, we're psychologists as much as anything because when you think about buying and selling a business, it's probably one of the top three most emotional things you do in your life. Getting married, having kids, loss of a loved one def definitely are, the, are in the top three. But when you think about laying everything on the line, personally guaranteeing, putting your life savings into buying a business or the inverse of selling something that you created from zero, that you've grown your blood, sweat and tears, you've got to really think about what are you going to do next? So don't look behind you and think, what are you retiring from? Think about what you're going to. How are you going to give back to the community? Are you going to spend more time with your family? Are you going to travel? Are you going to give to your church or a charitable organization? Think about the positive things you can do versus thinking about where you came from. You don't have to have a long explanation when a buyer says, why are you selling? And I always joke with my sales, like, don't answer that by saying, well, I don't have to sell. Well, no, no one has to sell and no one has to buy. But what really, what are you going to do if you did sell? If you found the right buyer at the right price and terms, what are you going to do next? Knowing that you've got a transition that sometimes can be as short as three months. I've seen sellers stay on for three, four, five years because they got along so well with the new ownership group. The new ownership group brought so much to the table, the sellers just up to their, uh, you know, top of what they can handle when the back office was all taken away from them. All they had to do was go out and sell and they're working 30 hours a week instead of 90 hours a week. They love what they're doing again. So think about those type of things. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. So real quick, I'm running out of time. I want to leave time uh, uh, for the end. There's three types of buyers mainly. You've got individuals that could be corporate backed, coming out of corporate America or serial entrepreneurs. You've got strategic, which means they're already in business. And you've got private equity group that sometimes have family trust. And those private equity groups can be committed funds, meaning they've got a you know, $500 million fund, or it could be a search fund where they've got to find the business and then they go raise the money. Most businesses below 10 million are going to be bought by individuals with SBA backed loans. I can explain that offline. Strategic businesses can also obtain SBA loans. Private equity normally is, is got their own funds. They have committed funds. They have to deploy those funds in a certain time frame. So they're often very motivated to deploy that money so they don't have to give it back to their individual investors. But under that, they want normally what's called a structured sale. So you're not going to get just your paycheck at, at the closing table and you shake their hand and give them the key and walk away. You may have to retain some ownership in the new company that's for them. You may have to have a seller note. You may have to have an earn out. So it's called a structured sale. And I can take any of those questions offline at a later time. Uh, next slide, please. Very good. I hope they left enough time for our, our last presenter. Thank you for listening. Jay, thank you very much. That was really, uh, really helpful. Um, and in fact, it, it's a great segue there when you're talking about private equity groups and funds uh, to our next speaker, Laura Markley, because she is a partner at one of those. Uh, as mentioned, Laura is the managing director at NRV. That is a venture capital firm in Richmond. Um, and I know we sometimes use the terms venture capital and private equity interchangeably. Um, I just think of it as uh, groups with a lot of money uh, that want to buy stuff. So Laura will give us a slightly more nuanced explanation of it uh, in a second. Laura began uh, in the financial services industry with some heavy hitters uh, in New York, including Deutsche Bank, uh, and she did audit and valuation work at PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, she also uh, worked in portfolio management at a private wealth firm uh, called Ziff Brothers. Um, and then at NRV, Laura serves as a general partner and investment committee member for NRV's early stage growth fund, uh, which is a series A and B focused venture capital fund. Uh, she assesses prospective investment due diligence, evaluates and negotiates investment deal terms, serves on portfolio company boards and engages with company CEOs to provide a variety of growth and financial consulting services. Laura is a Richmond native who earned a master's of accounting uh, at William & Mary and an MBA from Columbia University. 
Uh, she lives in Richmond with her husband and two children and serves as an adjunct professor uh, teaching financial, sorry, financing entrepreneurial ventures uh, to MBAs and undergraduate students at William and Mary. And of course, she volunteers on a variety of nonprofit boards. So, uh, Laura, with that, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Chris, for the kind interview. And Jay, I think a lot of our topics will tie in well together. So I am going to pick up the baton here a bit where Jay left it in terms of who buys companies. Uh, we have this sort of concept of venture capital and especially private equity, JT to sup with. And um, often I find, to Chris's point, we often interchange the two and they aren't exactly the same. So the plan today, just with my kind of 20 minutes or so, is to take a bit of a 30,000 foot view on what is venture capital? What is a typical VC venture capital investor looking for? How is that a little bit different from private equity? And what are the kinds of things that venture capital and private equity investors are looking for? So for those of you who are thinking about uh, the finance space, that might be helpful. But for those of you who are thinking about selling a company or financing a company, uh, there's some really good reasons to take venture capital or private equity money, and frankly, some good reasons not to. So hopefully this will be a helpful conversation just around what those are, what types of companies tend to be good fits for venture capital and private equity, and then just a few minutes at the end to look at what's happening right now in the market. Uh, so if you don't mind popping into the next slide, just a quick level set on what is the difference between venture capital and private equity. They are a little bit different, although more and more the lines are starting to blur. Uh, in theory, venture capital is for really early stage businesses. So this could be as early as, hey, I have an idea on a napkin. Uh, it could be quite late revenue stage, but the common denominator is usually that it's sort of a half-baked cake. There's part of the business model that's figured out and there's part that isn't, and the business is usually growing really quickly and they're looking for capital and also expertise from venture capitals to help figure that out. So they're usually early stage businesses and they're usually oriented towards revenue growth. Uh, Jay mentioned this sort of odd concept where SaaS, the software as a service companies, can get purchased for multiples of revenue rather than multiples of EBITDA. Venture capitalists tend to be very focused on growing the top line, that revenue line. They're often okay with negative operating income if it's fueling growth. So most, not all, but most companies backed by venture capital will probably be running at a loss uh, in theory because they're putting a lot of money into growing the business. That might mean hiring a lot of tech talent or you know, fill in the blank to help really grow the business quickly. Often companies backed by venture capital are exiting through M&A, uh, sometimes private equity buyouts and sometimes IPOs and SPACs. Uh, we'll touch uh, really briefly on SPACs. We could probably have our own webinar on that, especially in the last quarter where it's been uh, very up and very down. And so if anyone's interested in SPACs, happy to field a question at the end or chat offline about that. So private equity is a little bit different. Typically, they're later stage businesses. Usually, they're oriented towards accelerating cash flow. So this is a lot more in common with what Jay was talking about. How do we increase the efficiency and the cash flow of a business? And so typically, they're focused on positive EBITDA, uh, that sort of cash flow metric beyond kind of the interest depreciation. And usually, they're exiting through to maybe an IPO or a SPAC, or even more frequently, they're just harvesting the cash flow. So venture capitalists have this sort of conundrum where because the company is running a loss, the business is not throwing out cash. They're using their cash to grow. And so a venture capitalist, in order to exit, really needs to sell the business. Um, a private equity group may have more flexibility. They may want to sell if they're on a time clock, but more often they're able to just take cash flow out of the business and potentially could be a longer term hold. If you don't mind, next slide. So why do we need venture capital? I think um, if you follow the news over the last few years, there are definitely some businesses that have gotten huge amounts of funding that are just personally head scratchers to me. Um, you know, how something like WeWork got just the hundreds of millions of dollars that it did at the you know valuations that were sky high uh, because they called themselves a tech company. So the question here is, can you, can you just label yourself a tech company and run with it and just get all the money you need when you don't have a sort of healthy underlying business? Uh, the answer isn't always no, but it should be no. Um, so why is venture capital needed? What is the healthy way in which venture capital should be deployed? Uh, this was from a survey from CB Insights. They tend to have a lot of interesting venture capital uh, type resources available. So check them out if you're interested in the VC space. They did a survey of the reasons that startups fail uh, and a huge number of them do. So just to give you a little insight into NRV, we have a fund that invests in startups. 
Uh, our fund is relatively small, so our current fund is about $33 million. We'll invest it across 10 to 15 startups. I will talk about why the investing process makes a difference when you're thinking about what kind of cash to take in potentially for your business. Uh, but as we look across our portfolio of 10 to 15 companies, it is our assumption from the beginning that up to a third of them will likely fail. Another third may only get our money back. And of the final third that we expect to have some sort of return, usually there may only be one or two that's a huge home run, smash hit, and makes up for the rest of the losses. So obviously we're hoping we don't exactly hit those stats. We're hope we don't want a third of our companies to fail and we don't want another third of them to kind of maybe get our money back if that. Uh, but that's sort of the general statistics out there for startups. Many, many startups fail. Why is that? Uh, so the top one is no market need. There is a tendency by founders to get very attached to their business and to look at it through a lens of this is a problem I want solved, uh, not necessarily a problem the market wants solved. And the second is they ran out of cash. So you can have a really healthy, really great company that runs out of cash and can't keep going, uh, perhaps because they're growing so quickly. They need inventory. They're hiring staff. They might be getting paid on a delay because they're a small company with not much leverage when they go out to a customer wanting to get their invoices paid. So venture capital is coming in to help solve that second problem, uh, to fund a company, to kind of bridge that gap while they're growing really rapidly, and also to provide, hopefully, good advice and resources and connections to help solve some of the other problems like figuring out product market fit. Uh, next slide. So what does VC money look for? Usually uh, the first one they're looking at is team. So often when NRV comes in, we're looking at a founder team and saying, has this team done something similar before? Uh, is this team needing the kind of help that we as NRV can provide or whatever your VC potential investor could provide? Uh, and are they coachable? Do we have good values alignment? It's very easy to accept a check from an investor. It's very hard to get rid of a VC investor uh, if it's not a good values and fit alignment. So if you take nothing away from this talk, I would say to be thoughtful about what kinds of cash you take in. If it is venture capital money, usually that investor is going to bring take equity in your company and often take a board seat too. And so you want to be very choosy with the kinds of investors that you bring in. The VC will also be looking at the technology in your company. It doesn't have to be a SaaS platform, but what makes your company unique? What makes their approach to the market unique? Your traction, how scalable you are, that gets back to our growth question. Do you have a revenue model? Have you figured out yet what the market is paying you for? And also the industry fit. Uh, NRV is biased towards companies based in Virginia. We just find that the closer we are geographically to a company, the easier it is for us to be helpful. Uh, usually that's board service and also just being on speed dial for all the many issues that can potentially come up for a young company. But every fund is different. And so that can be a little bit challenging when you're a business looking for money to figure out what VC should I talk to. Some are very specific on industry. Maybe they only do health technology related to hospitals uh, based on Epic and Cerner, right? It could be that focused. Or you could have a much broader fund like NRV where we will look at almost any industry as long as we feel like uh, the kinds of things the company needs help with are skill sets that we can provide. Uh, next slide. So what drives venture capital? What is a VC looking for if you're thinking about taking money from them? They are temporary capital. So this is a really, really important point. Venture capital is temporary capital. The idea is that this capital comes into your business, it drives growth, and it has to get back out. Uh, this is because most venture capital investors are part of a fund. NRV's fund is a 10-year fund. We have five years to deploy, quote unquote, deploy, put money into companies and five years to harvest to get that money back out. Um, and it's a very firm time clock in our fund documents. And we can't go even a day over that 10 year time clock without getting specific approval from our LPs. So that means for our companies that if we invest in year four of the fund, there's only six years left, right? And so we might go to a founder and say, hey, look, um, we're four years into our fund. We'd love to be able to help your company to grow. But in six years, we're going to need all of our money back, all of our equity money out. Um, are you founder planning to sell in six years? Does that align with your sort of vision and values for your company? Uh, if not, are there some other creative ways? Maybe we could sell our piece to another investor. Uh, maybe we could get a new external person to come in and take not only us out, but maybe some other friends and family if other people have invested. Uh, so this timing of an exit concept is really important because a fund is on a clock and you want to make sure that your exit timeline is aligned with a potential venture capital investors. 
They often have a specific return profile. Uh, we can go offline into more details about what that might mean, but an internal rate of return or ROI benchmarks. Some funds will say, hey, I'm, I'm not going to invest unless I can have an annual return of 30 or 40 percent. Um, that means that your company has to grow really, really quickly in theory. Uh, and that too can have some pros and cons. You might think, well, why wouldn't I want to grow really quickly? That sounds great. Uh, the downside to that is you're going to have to take in more capital to grow, and that means giving away more equity in your company. So there's some really good reasons to bring in that venture capital. As I mentioned, it can help bridge that gap while you're running deficits and growing. It can help bring in some really great skill sets, especially at the board level and the advisor level. Uh, but on the flip side, it's on a clock, which means it's going to be driving for an exit. And it could have um, some requirements around higher growth rates where you might say, you know what, I, I think this business could grow really profitably at 10 or 15 percent. But my venture capitalist is saying, hey, it's got to grow 30 percent. Um, you know, I'm going to have to take in more money than I want to give away more of my company than I want to in order to fuel that growth. Next slide. So where does venture capital come from? Uh, there's a variety of different places and each sort of region has its own flavor. I'll have a couple of slides on what the Mid-Atlantic looks like in just a moment. But generally across the board, you're going to start with your friends and family. Uh, so this is typically your very early stage. You've got an idea on a napkin, maybe uh, very early traction, and you're going out to literally your friends and your family saying, um, you believe in me. I would love to just have a little bit of money to see if I can make this business work. Next, you can go to seed and accelerator. So there are seed stage investors. A seed stage just means a very early stage investor. And accelerators are programs that are built around helping startups um, not make expensive mistakes. So a founder may go out on their own and try a bunch of things. And if nine out of 10 of them don't work, um, they've learned a lot, but it was probably an expensive way to learn a lot. Accelerators try to do a shortcut to all that learning. They often have formal programming, mentors, advisors uh, to help a startup figure out how do I grow? What money should I take in or not take in? And how do I pace that out? Some of the accelerators around here uh, that are well known are 757 Angels and Lighthouse Labs. Again, if you're interested in learning more about this, I'm happy to chat offline. Angels are often the next stage, either during or after seed stage and accelerators. They're usually individuals, high net worth individuals that are just interested in companies and interested in founders. Uh, they tend to be a little bit more flexible money, but it can also be a lot of work. You know, if you have an angel putting in 20, 30, $10,000 at a time, and you're trying to raise a million, you're going to be going on a lot of coffee meetings. You know, you might have 200 coffee meetings to get 10 or 15 angels to say yes and write a check. Venture capital funds are called institutional capital. That just means it's a literal business where the business is putting money into startups through venture capital, just like NRV. So we're a venture capital fund. Uh, we take investors in, we accumulate that money, and then the team here at NRV decides how to deploy that money out into startups. Later stage companies could think about private equity funds and SPACs. Again, we won't get into SPACs here, but um, they, over the course of last year and this year, deployed about $150 billion into the public markets. Uh, they've been cracked down a lot in the last month. The SEC has announced they're going to be taking a hard look at SPACs. So uh, we'll see what happens. That's definitely one of those that's changing day by day, and it'll be interesting to keep an eye on. Uh, there's traditional and hybrid banks as well. Uh, I think if I was giving advice to a business owner, I would say if you can get debt, take debt before you take venture capital, which is a strange thing to say since I deploy venture capital money. But with bank debt, you pay it back, right? You don't have the dilution of having to permanently give away potentially a significant part of your company. Um, on the other hand, it's often really hard to get traditional bank debt as a young company. And if you're running a deficit, if you're not yet profitable, that goes from difficult to quasi impossible. Not always impossible, but often really challenging. And so most of our startups um, usually aren't candidates for traditional bank debt. There are hybrid banks. Uh, these are often venture banks, banks designed to work with early stage venture companies, and they will deploy loans, but they'll often pair them with some sort of equity tool as well. So a warrant or an option, there's some different ways to skin the cat, but they're looking for ownership so that they have some potential upside in exchange for the risk of giving a loan to a really early stage company. Uh, next slide. So these are just a few slides to wrap up with on what does venture look like in the US right now and specific to the Mid-Atlantic. 
Um, I like to share this slide just because I think there is a perception often with venture capital that it's all happening in Silicon Valley in New York City, um, and this really isn't the case. So these next couple of slides are from a national group called the Angel Resource Institute. Um, this is the HALO report, H-A-L-O, like an angel investor has a halo. Uh, it's all about how early stage and angel investments are deployed across the country, and it is free. So for those of you who are interested in the space, feel free to check it out after this, and um, I'm happy to again chat about anything you see online that's of interest. But the compelling thing to me about this is that ventures in the U.S. are really spread all across the country, which I think is fantastic. I think it's really good for the nation that a lot of our companies are not just based in Silicon Valley, New York City. Um, here in Virginia, we have a really great cost of living. We have a business friendly environment. And so personally, I think it's been really exciting over the last 10 years that I've been at NRV to see more and more companies able to stay in Virginia and North Carolina and the broader mid-Atlantic. They're able to attract venture funding even when they aren't in San Francisco and New York. And frankly, we're seeing quite a number uh, move. I know we we had the, the quote, I think it was about Charlotte earlier, of hundreds of people moving a day. Um, Virginia is seeing something similar with a flight from sort of this post-COVID world of big cities. We'll see how much of that sticks around once things are back to normal, knock on wood, um, post-COVID in the coming months or year. Uh, but I think the trend is here to stay where startups are realizing they can be almost anywhere in the nation and still attract the investment capital they need and still grow their company. Next slide. Uh, this is again from the HALO report that just shows you about how much money um, angel investors across the country are deploying. Uh, we are part of the Mid-Atlantic, which is that sort of orangish, reddish bubble. And obviously, California is just an outlier here. So some stereotypes about California are true. Uh, they tend to make really big dollar investments um, in really big rounds. And so they usually are putting just huge checks behind ventures. Um, that really isn't our thesis in NRV. At NRV, we believe more in what we call real businesses. And so we might often say no to deals in technology where they're getting huge checks from a California venture investment. The valuation may just be too high, in our opinion, um, or they, the company may just be taking on more money than we think they should, or they may be doing that sort of conundrum where they're just trying to grow so fast that they're taking in tons of capital and potentially not growing in super profitable ways. It can be a problem if you're just trying to grow revenue and you're not worried about, hey, are, are we actually making money on this additional business? Do we actually have a good margin here? Um, so at an we tend to focus more on the bottom line. We tend to deploy our venture capital money with smaller checks uh, towards businesses that are healthy, growing at the top line, but also have really good insight into the bottom line. So that even if they're not profitable yet, they have really good visibility on how they'll get to profitability with a little bit more scale. Next slide. So just a couple last slides here as I wrap up. Um, this is specific to the Mid-Atlantic with very early stage investment. Again, this is sort of that angel round slash early venture. Um, interestingly, across the country in the US, by far IT and technology is the most active investment area. In the Mid-Atlantic, it's actually um, B2C. So consumer products and services. I um, thought that was a little bit interesting. Biotech and healthcare are also up there, uh, B2B, and then we have some smaller ones, you know, energy, environmental. Uh, it is a little interesting to me that agriculture is such a small percentage of the venture investment, uh, given the kind of economy and just space we have in agricultural development in the mid-Atlantic. So if I had to take a guess, I would not be surprised five or 10 years from now if we see a lot more, quote, ag tech, agriculture technology, um, agriculture venture oriented businesses, because I think we do have a little bit of a disconnect in terms of how much money has gone into it, meaning not much, versus how much of our sort of space land economy in our area uh, is based around it. List of the most active angels, again, just for those of you who are interested in, in plugging into angel groups or accelerators, um, the deal structure is just how our deals structured? How is money invested into startups? We won't go into what all these mean, but preferred stock essentially means you're taking equity. It's a protected type of equity. So there's common stock and then preferred stock gets all the upside of common in venture, but it might also get a dividend. It might also get some voting protection. And so if you're thinking about venture, um, I will just plant the seed to please be very careful reading your term sheets and legal documents. Um, run them by me or someone else who knows the venture space well, because sometimes venture investors can put in some terms that might seem innocuous, but when you go out to sell your company or you're trying to do a vote or at the board level, you know, can cause some sticky wickets if you're not aligned with your investors. Convertible notes are a type of debt. And so you're just seeing here that um, sometimes we put debt into startups and sometimes it's more of a stock deal. And then I included this um, CEOs by gender and ethnicity. I just wanted to touch on um, all of the exciting things that are happening in venture, which we've touched on a lot of them. Uh, venture has grown a ton over the last five years. We've gone from about 
30 billion deployed in venture in the US 10 years ago to more than 150 now. So there's a lot of venture money at work. One of the areas we still need to make some strides in is diversity. So in the Mid-Atlantic region, um, more than or a little more than 90% of our CEOs founded by venture capital are male. Uh, you'll see the split by race there as well, that we have a ways to go. Uh, there was a study that came out by the Harvard Business Review just last week that only 2.3% of venture capital went to female-led teams. And another stat that came out from TechCrunch that 81% of venture capital funds are lacking a single black investor. So we have a ton of work still to do on diversity. Uh, it's an area I in particular am passionate about. A co-founder and I started a group called Women in Venture uh, that's trying to bring more diversity both to venture investors and to entrepreneurs. So there's a lot exciting going on. There are some things still to work on, uh, but in general, the Mid-Atlantic has been really active and I think has some exciting room to grow. Uh, next slide. So I'll just end here. Uh, this is my last slide just to show how much VC activity there has been. Uh, this is from the PwC Insights Money Tree Report. Again, this is another great free resource out there for those who want to dig in some more. Just showing the deal dollars on an annual basis uh, since 2002. So both deals and the amount of money getting deployed have gone up a lot. And that 2021 year to date number, if you're looking at the screen and, and can decipher the little numbers, um, looks initially small until you realize this is just for Q1. So last year in 2020, we hit a historical record with 133 billion of investment. That was with COVID, which sort of boggles the mind. And then this year, just in Q1 at 62 billion. So if you think, well, if Q2, 3, and 4 look like that, we could be more than 200. I don't know, we'll see. But certainly Q1 has been by far a record pace in terms of VC activity, um, very what I would consider frothy. And so it'll be interesting to see, is this a sort of permanent trend where companies stay private longer? Um, more and more companies go after venture capital as a way to systemically grow, sell, develop their business, uh, or are we just in a very frothy market? Uh, could be a little bit of a bubble, especially around some of the valuations we're seeing. Um, so a little bit TBD. I guess you'll have to tune into the conference next year to find out what happens next. Um, but just a snapshot there of, of how much is going on in the venture capital world. And again, for anyone with questions wanting to dive in, uh, happy to uh, tackle happy to that tackle in our Q&A. Laura, thank you very much. Um, very, very informative. Um, and, and as a reminder, I guess, to the group, um, if you have questions, please use the Q&A uh, chat feature um, and my partner Richard Crouch will will uh, read those and um, uh, ask them of our presenters. But in the meantime, um, uh, I had a couple of thoughts uh, both for you and Jay while, while you were each giving your presentations. And Laura, if I may pick up on your uh, comment there about ag technology, agricultural technology. Uh, I'll ask you first and then put the same question to Jay. What is your thought, what is your opinion on potential growth in the cannabis arena, both literal and financial? <laughs> Uh, so that's a good question. I'm going to punt a little bit on it because uh, we actually specifically won't invest in the cannabis uh, industry from the NRV side. But that said, we do have a focus in food, better for you food and ag tech. So we saw a lot of cannabis startups, especially I'd say starting two or three years ago. And most of them were sort of consumer facing. So not only kind of dispensaries, which weren't usually going out for venture capital, uh, but perhaps CBD infused. I mean, we had a CBD infused seltzer and kombucha and almost anything you can imagine. Um, where those startups really ran afoul and where I think is going to be a roadblock until it gets resolved is the state by state laws are just so different. Uh, the regulatory issues are so different state by state and what you can sell in California is very different from what you could sell in Virginia. And we actually had a, a startup we were talking to, we didn't invest in, but described, you know, they produced us cannabis infused seltzer in one state they were driving through another state where that product wasn't legal they weren't selling it they were just it was on a truck passing through the truck got stopped and the seltzer was seized and so they were talking about just the challenges of you know even if you're going to sell in california where it's legal if you're manufacturing in you know pennsylvania and you're driving it across the country you know can your product even legally travel through states even if you're not going to sell it so um just from my perspective you know take it with a grain of salt but i 
don't think we're going to see a ton until we get more uniformity at a sort of federal level around what can we sell and can we not sell. Uh, but we are seeing a lot of just sort of general buzz about it from entrepreneurs trying to get businesses going. Sure. I think, and Laura, I think Laura nailed go ahead, it. Jake. I, I don't, yeah, I don't have a lot to add. I, I agree. It's, it's state for state. It's not a tremendous uh, lot, amount of information in the southeast yet, uh, so we're not exposed too much to that. CBD definitely is 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 prominent, but but not the uh, cannabis and weed and whatnot. So, well, sorry, I don't have a lot of info on that. Sure, I just have this image um, going back a few years here. If you remember the movie Fast Times at Ridgemont High, I just. <laughs> <laughs> have this image of Jeff Spicoli saying, dude, I can form a business. And right. then that would be your typical founder. So, yeah. <laughs> but I know that's not true. I mean, there's huge national enterprises, you know, behind, behind it. it. So, so. Um, okay. Uh, another question, uh, I guess, for each of you, uh, maybe start with Jay. Um, have you all uh, encountered uh, crowdfunding or businesses that have tried to use crowdfunding as a way to raise capital? No, I mean we're, we're you know, know it's not your space. It's not. I'm sorry. I, again, I don't. I don't have a lot uh, of, of experience with that. When when people call us for capital raises and things like that, we're really that's really not. You know, we try to be very um, stick to our. You know, we 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 list and sell businesses, right? So we don't go too far outside of our little sandbox that we try to intentionally play in. Or if you've encountered a business owner who. Um, was successful or unsuccessful in raising money that way? No, I, I, I haven't. I don't have a lot of information. I apologize, Chris. Sure. Chris, I, could, I can help a little bit with that one. Sure. I would just say that um, we've seen a number try. I haven't seen many do it very successfully. I'd say we saw more of it kind of four to five years ago than we are right now. And I think one of the big challenges, and this I guess gets back to a little bit of a theme of state versus federal regulations, but um, startups are required right now to have accredited investors. So a million dollars in liquid net worth, not including your home or certain income levels that are pretty material. It's sort of around $300,000 if you're a married couple. And so the problem was whose responsibility is it to make sure that your investors are accredited? Can you trust if they just say, yes, I'm accredited, or could that investor come back and, you know, perhaps sue you later for saying, hey, this startup went under. I didn't know what, I, you know, you didn't disclose all the risks. I wasn't accredited. You should have known. Um, so a lot of our startups who think about it often struggle because they've got one, the sort of accreditation issue of how do you make sure that all these little investors putting tiny checks in um, are sort of legally compliant with all the SEC rules that are out there, which are fairly involved. Um, and the second is just the reality of being a business owner that now you have like 300 people on your caps table that you don't know, um, <laughs> right. with really tiny amounts. And so the couple companies, you know, we met that had done it, found it to be a little bit of a nightmare because if, let's say you need to go out and raise another round of capital. You have to go back to all those crowdfunding people and say, okay, we need a majority vote to do, you know, whatever, you know, and you're chasing, you know, Jay and um, Charlotte who put in 30 bucks and, you know, Laura in California who put in 75 bucks. And so um, just, it, it had a lot of compliance issues on the back end that sort of made it more of a headache than it was worth in terms of the check size. Uh, but conceptually, I like the concept of crowdfunding. And, you know, I think there's going to be this important question of, how do we allow access for more people to invest in private companies now that private companies are staying private so much longer? Um, it, it becomes a little bit of a fairness question. You know, you want to protect people from a really risky investment. Do you also want to allow access, given so many companies are growing really well privately and perhaps staying private and never getting to the public markets? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I had, I remember there was a, a lot of uh, conversation about crowdfunding a few years ago, like you mentioned, but hadn't hadn't heard much recently on it. Um, okay, and um, I guess I, I don't know if we have any other questions, but I had uh, kind of one, uh, if we don't have any other questions, uh, one sort of wrap up uh, for each of you, Jay and Laura. One is, or I mean, the question is, what are, what are one or one or two of the top challenges that um, you face uh, when when dealing with a founder uh, in in trying to sell the business or attract uh, investment? You know the the common theme that I hear is that a lot of founders have a very difficult time accepting the true value of their business, always thinking that it's too low. Um, you know, I've heard other th things about having you know uh, too many family members on the payroll uh, i don't know what what are sort of the like the common things that that you see when you're 
uh, dealing with companies like that. Yeah, you touched on it, Chris. I mean, managing expectations, ensuring that, uh, you know, and what, what I tell people is, you know, you're the only one that truly knows every single benefit you derive out of running this business and what it took you to start from zero and get to this place. So there's no one in the world that's going to see the same value you see. So all we can do is, is try to educate you on what the buyer and, and the lenders are looking for, how they value this type of business, how they look at the intangibles. There's a science to the valuation, which is just plugging in the numbers. There's an art to figure out why this business and this industry is worth a higher multiple than a similar business you know, that, that's in the same industry in a different location. So trying to figure out and pull out the intangibles and, and trying to document you know, the things that are wrong with the business. It's OK to have something wrong with your business, but we need to document it and have, have something to kind of negate that and, and have a, a, a plan for what this is, isn't doing very well. This is the opportunity type of thing. So manage expectations. And also, they're not used to having uh, the direct feedback that, that we'll shoot them. Like they're used to being in charge and the employees answer to them. And, and one of the first things I say is like, I'm going to shoot you straight. And if you get emotional and get funny, you know, I'm just going to say, hey, listen, you're getting a little bit emotional about this. You need to look at the rational uh, perspective on what's going on. This is part of the negotiations. I know deal fatigue is set in. It's set in for all of us, but we need to. We're at the two yard line. We're not going to. We're not going to punt at the two yard line when it's when it's fourth and two at the you know th with five seconds left in the game. So you know, just trying to keep keep them through that and and, and hold their hand because again, it's most time it's their first trip to Disney, if you will, and they've never done it before, and it's the biggest asset, and it's an emotional roller coaster. All right, thank you, Laura. How about you? Yeah, so it really varies for us uh, by stage of company. So when we get involved at the very earliest stage with a founder, I'd say the challenge is they're often um, making sure they're ready to let go because they won't be the only owners any longer, and they won't, you know, they'll they'll need a board and governance structure, and the investors will have opinions and the right to vote on things, and so helping them navigate through that concept of like this is no longer my baby. I'm like sending the baby off to college and um, letting other people have a, an influence and trying to help that business really grow into the best business it can be um, is always sort of an interesting inflection point. And then there's usually another one once the business has grown really rapidly. Um, this isn't always true, but we often find that founders are really passionate about the product or service that they base the company on. And if the company's grown really rapidly and now it's, let's say, a $200 million revenue business, the CEO is no longer going out and doing that sort of product or service personally. They're managing a giant team and dealing with governance issues and legal and HR. And often we find um, the founders really don't like that as much as dealing with the actual product and service, which was the, the love of the business that they got into in the first place. And so that might mean having them transition out of a CEO role into a like chief product officer or chief strategy officer or chief, you know, fill in the blank that really helps them do more of what they love to do as opposed to all the kind of managing and people oriented stuff that comes along with a big company. Um, and then at exit, you know, I think um, the biggest one for us is making sure that we're aligned going out to an exit. And it's it's all the things Jay mentioned. And it's also who buys my company. Uh, because as an investor, obviously, you know, we have a fiduciary responsibility to our fund to get as best of a financial return as we can at exit. Our founders often want value alignment with the buyer so that if they're, you know, they're saying, well, whose hands am I putting my baby into? Are they going to treat, you know, treat my child the way I want it treated? Uh, whereas an investor might be like, well, but this other person's offering three times as much money. You know, maybe we go with uh, the higher offer. So making sure we're really navigating what is it that we want out of a sale? Um, who is, can we hit both those things? Both have the highest bid and the best sense of, hey, these people are really going to protect our, our employees and protect our supply chain and and do all the right things for the business too. All right, great. Thank you very much. Um, and now I'll turn it over to uh, Richard Crouch uh, if there's any more questions or any final thoughts. Yes, I'm Richard Crouch, a partner at Van Devender Black. Thank you, Chris. And uh, thank you again to our speakers and our attendees today. Looks like we have uh, one more question from one of our uh, attendees, uh, Tracy Gregoria, who's a past participant and award uh, recipient uh, from this particular forum. So thank you for that. Uh, her question is, our experience is that banks want to see profit and are not always interested in continuing to invest profits like a VC understands. Is this the norm across the board with banks or are there some that want to work with entrepreneurs to reinvest to fuel future growth? And that this is for Jay or, or Laura. Laura's probably better to handle that. My, my joke about banks is they lend to 
money to people that don't need it. So. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I do think generally I would say that statement is true. Um, there are some exceptions. There are some banks that are more oriented towards young companies. Often we find those are either local banks or um, banks with a nonprofit mandate. So something like Virginia Community Capital, which also has a nonprofit arm underneath the bank. And so they can be a little bit more flexible on taking risks if the business aligns with some of their um, more mission oriented focuses. Uh, the venture banks are also out there as an option, which I just lightly mentioned, but they will dive into even um, operational negative, so non-profitable companies. It's going to come with a pretty hefty interest rate though, and it's going to come with a pretty hefty equity requirement. Um, so while in general, I like to recommend debt for our companies because you're not having to permanently give part of your company away, in reality, our companies have struggled mightily to get any bank to, to underwrite them. Um, or to your point, you know, they require enough cash on hand so that you can't go out and grow. And so in the end, it really isn't worth it. So I like it as a theory, but I'd say in practicality over the last 10 years, um, we've had two or three of our companies get venture debt and essentially none get traditional debt. Um, although there are some banks that are more flexible than others, generally the more local you go. Okay, well, thank you so much for that. And seeing no additional questions, I did want to remind all of the attendees that you can receive a copy of today's presentation by accessing the link that's been previously provided under the Q&A section as well. And I um, wanted to thank you everyone again, uh, Dr. Agarwal from ODU's Strom College of Business, Jay Offerdell, Offer excuse me, from Viking Mergers and Acquisitions, and Laura Markley from NRV. Certainly could not do this program without you all, so we appreciate the very valuable information that you all have provided today. I did want to remind everyone that it is our goal, and it seems far more likely than it did this time last year, to actually have an in-person version of this event like we once did and uh, look forward very much to seeing many of you there at that point in time. So again, thank you for joining us for the Mid-Atlantic Capital Sources Forum and stay safe and we will be in touch with you soon. Thank you so much.